now reconvene to open session for the Tuesday, August 20th, 2019 council meeting. Roll call, please. Council Member Mosby. Present. Council Member Vega. Here. Council Member Cordova. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Dirk Starbuck. Present. Mayor Janelle Osborne. Here. Reportable action from closed session. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. The City Council met in closed session to discuss the one item on the agenda, which is labor negotiations with the Lompoc Police Officers Association and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Uh, the council gave direction to staff and got a, a report from staff, but no reportable action was taken. Thank you for that. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Manager Report, please. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a reminder that this Thursday, August 22nd at 6.30 p.m. here in the council chambers, we will be holding a special council meeting to discuss a possible sales tax for the March 2020 ballot. We hope everyone will turn out and join in for that discussion. I'd also like to thank the volunteers, Lompoc Police, uh, San Barbara County Sheriffs, um, for helping search for Mr. Donald Bishop. He's a 94-year-old man who has gone missing um, we do hope and pray he's found quickly and safe, but if anyone does see him, please notify the police as quickly as possible. Um, another one is given the different emergency events that have happened around the state and in the country, including what we might have here is the possible public safety power shutoff or PSPS. City staff is going to be holding next week an emergency operations training uh, just to ensure that we're prepared for any possible issues that may arise from different either natural events or otherwise. So we'll be having police, fire, different areas, public works, working together through a, a training exercise next week. So that's it. Council Member Mosby. Uh, um, a couple meetings back, the member of the public was concerned about our new way we were keeping uh, uh, the videos and documents and stuff. And uh, I asked you if we'd had any lost and you, you said we hadn't really lost anything yet. And so re reviewing for the, the uh, tax hearing that's coming up, I went back and I looked at the past meeting and I noticed that uh, right when I made a motion, there's about three to four minutes of the video that's edited out. Um, is the reason why this happened? Yes, I looked that up. Give me one second here. I was asking our video. Um, Had an answer here. If you can give me a second, um, it said, and I don't have the proper terminology. It's in here somewhere. I got too many emails. Um, that there was a lockup on something on the master controller, and okay, let me try and search here real quick. So I found out that two weeks prior to this, it was available and then all of a sudden it's removed. So it, it just, it's kind of perplexing this right at that time. So I was trying to find out what my full motion was and stuff so I could oh. come in and talk about it, but it's, the video's gone. Okay, let me, I'll look into that some more. I, I had a different, yeah, I can give, I'll find it and give it to you at the end. It's, I gotta search through some different ones. Right, do we know if this is happening at other times? It's kind of a, an official record and I don't. Yeah, I can, I can ask on that. Well, maybe there's some truth in what the one lady was saying, I guess, coming forward. Okay. Thank I'll you. find out. Any other questions, concerns for city manager? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, public comment on the consent calendar. The consent calendar is items listed to be considered as routine and will be enacted after one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless good cause is shown. Prior to the council vote, any items withdrawn from the consent calendar for separate discussion will be addressed immediately before the second oral communications near the end of the meeting. Public comment for consent calendar is now open. There are three minutes max. 
Seeing no one come to the microphone, we will close public comment on consent calendar and bring it back to council. Council Member Vega. I'll make a motion that we accept the consent calendar as stated and I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any additional questions, concerns? Seeing none, we will need to go to a roll call vote because our voting system has problems at the moment. So roll call, please. Council Member Mosby? Aye. Council Member Starbuck? Aye. Council Member Cordova? Aye. Council Member Vega? Yes. Mayor Osborne? Yes. And that passes 5-0. Now the floor will open for oral communications regarding city matters for three minutes maximum. If there is something that is not on the agenda regarding city matters that you would like to speak to, please step forward. Deb Andrews, Mission Hills. We're learning the reasons why the city budget has exploded in the last 20 years. The proper role of government is health and safety. It took months and thousands of dollars to determine if a winery could legally host a music recital. Sandwich shops are harassed to install an expensive grease trap they don't need. City staff stated all restaurants should be treated the same. That is the definition of central planning. Overregulation and taxation is socialism, government control of the economy. Over the last few months, we have heard testimony describing how some city staff subjected local small businesses and citizens to harassment and intimidation. These acts remove the mask of this agenda. I urge you to instruct city staff to investigate what regulations may be eliminated. I urge you to instruct staff to review employee responsibilities and conduct an analysis of time on task. Perhaps they wouldn't have time to harass and bully citizens and businesses. Citizen and business owners' description of how they have been treated by some city staff suggests there may be issues in your human resources department. I urge you to investigate that. What potential employee characteristics are preferred and prioritized? Which applicants receive preference? Local citizens, veterans, or sociopaths? I urge you to return to delivery of basic services to citizen owners efficiently, effectively, and professionally. A city staff person expressed concern too much council time was spent on citizen appeals. Citizens at the microphone are the most important part of your meeting. We would have never known how citizens have been bullied and jerked around as they sought help from the city if they had not come forward to this microphone. I was alarmed to read that a bike and walking trail is planned. We've been advised our budget does not balance. Services are reduced to save money. We have to have volunteers maintain our parks, but we can afford to paint murals on garbage trucks and create new bike trails. I've sat here and heard many citizens seek help and services, but I've never heard a cry for help for painting garbage trucks or bike trails. This suggests new work projects for favored, connected, cabal operators take precedence over citizen services. Please get back to basics. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, and uh, community. Um, I gave each of the council members a, uh, a document to, uh, uh, to read and thing, and, uh, uh, and I'm here to uh, talk about <coughs> uh, the possibility of a summit meeting between the city of Lompoc and the Lompoc Unified School District. Uh, there was, <coughs> I've been a citizen here since 1962, and I finally have come to realize there are two bridges in Lompoc. One is the, uh, two rivers in, in Lompoc. One is the San Inez River, and there are three bridges that connect the San Inez River with the other parts of the, of the county and committee. 
The other river is kind of indivisible, and there's a big river between the Lompoc Unified School District and the City Council. <coughs> and in my understanding in coming to City Council meetings and talking to people and so forth, is that when people coming to, families coming to a community, the first thing that they ask for, what is the housing? And the second thing is, what is the public schools uh, all about? And then they make their decisions. Uh, we have a bit of a problem with our public schools, uh, losing three bond issues, the infrastructure and so forth and that. And, um, and there's a couple of other items that I don't want to go into. But I passed out a document to you uh, at the last uh, Lompoc Unified School Board meeting. I gave a copy of the document to each each school board member and superintendent, uh, Mr. McDonald, and I've given all five city council members a copy of that. Uh, Derek, that mine was on the yours <laughs> fell off. <laughs> you have it now, and I have given a copy to uh, uh, to the city manager as well. I have talked to some of the city, a couple of city council members, and not all city council members because. Uh, <laughs> You were right in the middle of the budget and everything else, but I have talked to all five uh, school board members, and there seems to be a very positive way of bringing this summit together uh, sometime uh, in the, uh, later this year. So we're we're right now in the preliminary talking stages, uh, working with the uh, economic development committee, uh, with, especially with the chairperson uh, Jeremy uh, Ball, and. Um, the leadership is there. The leadership is with the city. The leadership is sitting behind behind those uh, desks. The leadership is down at the school district as well. We have the people. We have the creativity. Now it's the process. Now the thing of pulling it together. So I just wanted to update you as to where we are. And as I said, it's still in the preliminary stages. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council, for you know have, giving me an opportunity to come up here and uh, speak with you guys. My name is uh, Jeffrey Hall, and I'm your uh, representative on the Board of Trustees for Allen Hancock. And I'm here just to give you an update on the uh, Promise Program. But before I do that, let me uh, piggyback on the uh, speaker who just spoke. Uh, the City of Santa Maria currently uh, every three months, they have a joint meeting with all the local school districts and, and, and including Ellen Hancock, and they talk about the affairs of the uh, school, school districts, both elementary and uh, high school. So I would really encourage that to happen right here in the uh, city of Lompoc. Now, the Promise Program is a publicly funded program that's run by uh, Ellen Hancock Foundation, and it starts in the fifth grade. And for your information, since you're the public, you're the, you're the ones that's funding this program, it's been a great success. Uh, for this year, a um, matter of fact, uh, yesterday, I think, was the first day of school uh, uh, at, at Hancock. Out of uh, almost 300 graduates uh, from Cabrillo High School, 143 of new freshmen enrolled in Allen Hancock this year. And in Lumpoc High, 148. So, and I don't think it was about, it was a little less than 300 uh, kids graduated uh, from both schools. So that's just about half, a little over half of the population. So uh, the Promise Program is working and it starts in the fifth grade. And for those of you who want, and who, who want uh, to, to know a little bit more about the Promise Program, uh, Ellen Hancock uh, conduct tours. Matter of fact, this Thursday from 10 to 11, uh, uh, that's the 22nd, there'll be a tour. And next week, uh, August the 28th, there'll be another tour at uh, 10, from 10 to 11. Then next month, there'll be two more tours. So those of the, you who want some information on, on that, just call the college and you'll get it. Uh, and one final thing, uh, those of you who want to become involved in the, uh, in the, uh, in, in, in the college, we have some auxiliary committees, some advisory committees that we encourage the public to get involved with. We have 39 of them, and it's a voluntary thing. It don't cost anything, and you get a, a intimate knowledge 
of, of, of how the college is run, and then you'll, you'll uh, contribute something to your community. So I encourage you to volunteer for these committees. Thank you much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jason Byard. I am the Southern Regional Manager with Lemus Feed and Pet Supply. Uh, I have uh, been in this position now for about five, five and a half years and have moved recently to Lompoc, my wife and I and our family. Um, thank you first for letting us uh, get up here and talk to you guys about the issues in the city. Uh, we as a company are so proud to be a part of the Lompoc community. We opened our doors 23 years ago. Uh, at the location that we're currently at, uh, we were actually the first tenant in that building. Uh, and when we moved in, there were weeds six feet high <laughs> and a dirt floor. Um, but we like Lompoc so much, we decided to buy the building last year. And uh, as our customers know, we've uh, recently done a, a renovation of our shop, upgraded a little bit, and expanded uh, the services to the community. Um, one of the, uh, the things that... Uh, I'd like to address tonight actually is uh, an issue that we're all familiar with um, all too well in this city, um, and that's homelessness uh, in the Mission Plaza and uh, the pathway down to the riverbed, um, trash and graffiti and all those issues that surround uh, that issue. Um, we've seen in the last month at our property a tremendous uptick in traffic going to and from the plaza. Even two days ago, seeing five people go down into the riverbed with tarps and cardboard and all these sorts of things. Um, we've uh, become that pathway again and um, finding trash and needles and human waste uh, in our planters uh, right out front of our store. And um, it's, it's time for us to consider uh, revisiting this issue. Uh, I submitted some pictures to you, Madam Mayor. Uh, and Ms. Cordova, um, you, you should have uh, seen those. Those are literally, of, as of today, what it looks like around our property. We as a company have spent close to $40,000 on surveillance in and around our building. We cleared the trees that were providing concealment um, from rampant drug use behind our building all the way to our property line. Uh, and there, but there's only so much we can do as a company. We can't do anything about anything beyond our property line. Um, we can't do anything about property owners that refuse to pick up the trash in those areas. Um, the Mervyn's building continues to be an attractive nuisance uh, with uh, homeless people camping out there at the front doors, plugging in their cell phones to charge um, uh, for most of the day. And, and it's not just one or two, there's you know five, six at a time <laughs> camping out in front of it. Uh, and um, graffiti on the building itself sometimes takes more than a month. We've called the number on the building, we've talked to people and they say, well, we don't actually manage that property anymore that belongs to so-and-so somewhere and we'll call and they have any things. Um, bottom line, we as a company um, would like to see the council take more action to make sure that all of the money that we spent this last year and the results that we saw, we had so many months of no issues, no problems at all, um, but we have seen in the last month, month and a half, just a tremendous amount of uptick. Our customers are concerned. It's a safety issue for our staff, and I appreciate your consideration on it. Thank you for that. Mayor, City Council. Uh, I'm Etinoco, in a rep for City of Lompoc employees. Uh, it is my understanding that we are at the, almost at the end of our negotiating cycle and that you guys don't want to move on uh, insur the insurance issue and wages. And I believe that the cities will be able to uh, accommodate at least the uh, insurance side of it uh, based on the fact that we have over 25 to 30 positions that are open in our side. <clears throat> also, uh, our members are retiring. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys get an update on how many people retire 
have retired since January, and that has put a lot of pressure on uh, a lot of our members. So uh, I hope you guys can reconsider your position on those two items. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Terry Doutney. Um, I'm concerned with the state of our city. My property since the last council meeting when you, Mr. Mosby, Starbuck, and Vega refused to allow consideration of a 1% sales tax, my property's been broken into three times in the last two months. Um, I finally convinced my tenants to call the police because they kept saying it won't make any difference, they don't care. They finally called and the uh, police said they're down to half staff. I'm unclear on how you're protecting our city. And um, it almost feels like you're dead set on um, ensuring our position in the lowest quality of living in the county by refusing to even consider the sales tax. The way I see it, city council is considering whether or not we should have a 1% sales tax on the ballot. My position is why don't we have a 2% sales tax? The city needs help. We're not surviving on the income we have and something needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is, my name is uh, Michael Shreve. I'm a current resident of Lompoc. I've only been here for a couple of years. Uh, but I have noticed and I've heard that uh, our police department is lacking in funding. Some of the officers are working 12-hour shifts. Uh, they don't have the support of the community and they don't have the financial support. They have to have the equipment that they need to be able to patrol our city adequately. Um, and then I hear that we have funding for murals and uh, bike paths, and I wonder where the priorities of protecting the people and the community really are in the minds of the city government. Uh, also, the other item that I would like to question is that the homeless people were moved out of the riverbed and now they're they're in our streets they're sleeping in the doorways of, of the stores and the businesses uh, they're camped out behind Walmart and other places and we're always going to have the homeless where do you want them do you want them in the riverbed where they have a place where they can camp and survive, or do you want them camping out on your front porch? You know, I mean, I'm sorry, I would rather have them have a place where they can go and be than in, than in my neighborhood. It's not that I want to ignore them, but I want them to be able to have a place to be besides sleeping on my front porch. So, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't. Good evening, Wally Wilder from a resident of Lompoc. Uh, I'm here basically in support of the electrical workers. It just seems another issue where there's not enough money to take care of them. Uh, another issue where uh, Lompoc uh, trains people only to uh, have them go away because they get paid more elsewhere. Uh, to me, that's no way to run a business. Several of you are businessmen. Who of you would train somebody so they can work for somebody else who will pay them more? Uh, that's no way to run a railroad. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chelsea. I've been working with the city for 11 years. Some of you guys have met. Gilda, I haven't met you yet. Nice to meet you. Um, I have a family and I can't afford this medical insurance. And we need help. 
And I know that you have to balance the budget and you have debts to pay, but at what cost? Where am I supposed to go? That's all. Thank you. Kathy Howard, a Lompoc resident. Uh, we've heard from PSE and G that our power may be cut off in the event of fires almost anywhere in the state, and the city is proposing help with generators in terms of permits. But I'm suggesting that you might want to get friendlier with um, sun power and make it easier for residents to have that, which does not rely on PSE and G to supplement instead of noisy generators that are air polluting and uh, basically kill your ears. Uh, I really appreciate if the uh, DPW and the city manager maybe investigate that. At, at this point, I understand that you've provided all of that solar power that you have to have. Now think about solar power that helps the citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Lorraine Waldau, and this is the eighth month of this year, and we started the year with hope. We started the year talking about transparency, of bringing someone from District 1 on through a transparent uh, procedure. We talked about things that gave people um, something to look forward to from this council, from this city. And as the months have gone by, you can hear it in people's voices. You can hear what's happening as each month people's voices are ignored. Our city workers are put in a terrible position. We lose positions, we don't fill positions, public safety is going down the tubes. People don't have the confidence in this council. They don't have the hope that we started the year. So I hope that somewhere before December that a lot of this can get turned around and the residents of this city can be listened to and respected. Thank you. Hello, Honorable Council. This is Gary Holsey, resident of Lompoc. I would just like to update you for a moment on the appeals that I um, prepared uh, last council meeting. I am still ongoing on the expiration of that. Um, I've got a hold of the deputy of the state of California, and uh, they're um, suggesting to me the code says that uh, the permit application, it's not a permit, it's an application, does not expire, but it be becomes abandoned if you don't continue to work on it in good faith. And I feel like that I've been working on it in good faith, and I still have yet to receive a letter from Mr. Johnson or the building department suggesting anything to an expir expiration or abandonment of my application process. I have forwarded the information to the building department council, and I have not responded anything back yet from them other than the fact that uh, they have received my appeal. And so I just thought I'd let you know where, where I'm all at with that. Okay? Thank, Thank you. you. Hello, Leah Breitman, private citizen, Lompoc. Mayor Osborne, City Council. Just wanted to rise in, great haircuts by the way. Um, just wanted to rise in support and solidarity with our line workers. We need well-paid well paid line workers. It's beginning to be a safety issue. So they're not just some union, they're actually us and they need to get paid a decent wage and good medical care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, my name is John Schluter. I'm a resident of Lompoc. I'm here because I'm a concerned citizen. I hear you gentlemen and ladies that are up there um, bickering over our public safety. 
I live in an area where there's gang problems and there's an ongoing drug problem. You're complaining about the homeless, you set up a program to get, get them a house, and a lot of them will never be able to get that because they can't pass the drug test. I call the police to tell them I see people with firearms and weapons and there's gang problems and they come walking by and they go drive by and by the time they get there the people are already listening to their cell phones because the calls go out over the air and they're long gone. They're playing this game better than the law enforcement. I've talked to the captain, the new chief of police and the sergeants and the people around are tired. They've been kicked out of their places. They're going to lose their property because they can't get any, they can't get any support. You're bricking over 1% or 2%. If we can't get money for the public safety, how is Lompoc going to grow? How are you going to get the things you need to make this town what it could be? We're, we're in a beautiful place. Why does it have to be so difficult? I know the people around. I talk to them. I go around and talk to a lot of people, and they are tired, and they don't know what to do. They elect you to, so we can count on you to do the job. All I'm asking for you to do is to... Take a little time. At night, there's three or four police officers for the whole town. 50,000 people, four officers. That seems a little harsh. And then they can't get to everywhere. And when they go, they're long gone. And basically, what they're going through and marking down, well, we saw someone who did our call, but they didn't accomplish anything. It's important. I don't want to see any more people killed. There's been shootings. And as long as you have indifference, there's never going to get any change. I'm hoping that people get the straight information, not your part and not the police part, but all of it, so they can make an informed decision. Because I lived in California a long time, and I know when people get upset, they will get into action. And when they get into action, a lot of people are going to be upset because they're tired of the situation right now. And I believe the police force is doing the best they can. And I think you're doing the best you can, but if you can't work together, we're never going to go anywhere. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good evening, Council. This, I'm Mary Saladino. I've been a citizen in this town for more than 50 years. And I taught with the Lompoc Unified School District for almost 20 years. But there's one thing I do not understand. Every time our city had an election for mayor or city council, I was allowed to vote because of the residents where I live here within the city limits. However, this past election, somehow somebody got some people's addresses established in a way that you had to vote somewhere else outside of the place, outside of the city limit. And it was not clearly understood by me when I got to my regular voting place, I was not allowed to vote there. I was sent somewhere else, and I was not able to find that location. So I did not get to vote for city council this past election. And I certainly want to be able to vote this time. So can you please tell me why some of us were sent to different locations? Maybe it has already been addressed in the past, and maybe I didn't hear it. Sometimes I do forget things, but I do want to be able to vote when the next election comes. So maybe you could tell me why some of our voting locations were changed. When I did not change my address, I did not change my citizenship or anything else. Thank you, dear. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Good evening. I'm a resident of this city and uh, a businessman in this city. I own some rental properties, which are being surrounded by your local entrepreneurs. They sell drugs, they uh, sell bicycle parts, they sell anything that isn't nailed down. You know, this is the council chambers, so we need your help, obviously. 
I mean, you, if it says Consul Chambers out there and you can't help us, then change the name to Dandy's Inferno. Inferno. Remember the sign there? Abandon all hope, all ye who enter here. <laughs> that shouldn't be read outside the Consul Chambers. I shouldn't see boredom in your face. I should see concern. How can we do this? I know the police are overworked. They're, they're at about half strength, as near as I can tell. I worked on a police department uh, for five years in Hawthorne. I was a reserve. I was the reserve firearms coordinator, as a matter of fact, there for a while. Um, I didn't want to be a policeman, <laughs> not full time. But I'm telling you, this town is going to turn into LA or San Francisco unless we can support our policemen and we can support what it costs. Now, that's up to you. We depend on you to figure a way. A lady prior to me uh, suggested a sales tax. That's about the fairest way we can do it. Other people say that a, a sales tax is a regressive tax because it hurts poor people more. Well, the gangs in this town are hurting poor people more. How many shootings have we had? At least six since March, at least that many. Maybe there's more and those guys didn't die so it doesn't make the papers. But this consul must act upon this situation. We have direct public services that need you to uh, give us a, a way of taxing ourselves to pay for this. I hate taxes. Oh, God, I hate them. But I'll pay them because my tenants, they, they can't live. They can't. And that, these are folks. And I don't rent slums. My places are nice. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Ken Bridget. I've been uh, living here for 25 years. I want to piggy piggyback a, a little bit on what he said. Uh, what's, what's the plan on dealing with these gangs? You know, I really want to know that because I live on the 1300 block of West Fur, West Vale Park. I live right across the street. That's where they come at night, two or three o'clock in the morning, and shoot dope, have sex in their vehicles, throw their food out of the windows on the ground. During the broad daylight, 14, 15 year old gangbangers are sitting there in their cars, drinking liquor, alcohol, smoking weed. They don't care who walks by. They don't care what mother and her child is at the park trying to give her daughter or her son a, a ride on the swing. And they're just out there. And there's never any cops to drive by. When, when Chief Walsh was here, I got up here and I asked the same things. And Chief Walsh had a, a, a patrol car shoot by there at least once or twice a week. And that's all I'm asking, to just run these people off. My wife gets off work at 11 and 12 o'clock at night. I got to stand outside in the front of the door to make sure she gets in the house safely. Now, that's not fair. And I'm getting sick and tired of it. And, and a lot of these people have come up here and said just about the same thing. And the biggest problem from what I've been hearing sitting back there just recently, the biggest problem seems to be these gang, this gang violence. You know what I mean? And it's getting way out of control. Somebody else is getting ready to get killed in this community. Are you guys prepared for that? I mean, it's something they really need to be thinking about. We, you seem to be more concerned about pot shops and clubs with alcohol in them than worrying about dealing with these doggone gangs. I'm tired of it. I'm sick and tired of it. I have, as you, as you can see, I got a pretty bad temper, you know? And I'm serious. I almost got in a fight with several of them, you know? And I call the cops, every time I call the cops, could you please come run these people off? Because I get tired of it and I say something to some of them, you know? And I've already been in one fight in this community where somebody slugged me. And if you slug me, you're gonna get slugged back. I've already been in one fight. I don't want to have to get into another fight with these young gang members. You know, and I'm just getting tired of it. It's just getting crazy. Somebody needs to do something about that. Send a patrol car by there once a night. All he has to do is just drive by and flash his light. Because if one of my kids are killed, I am not responsible for my actions. 
I'm not responsible for my actions. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll close public comment and bring it back to the council agenda. Our first item is a public hearing. It is the appeal by the Subway Restaurant for Utility Director ruling on request for reconsideration regarding enforcement of Lompoc Municipal Code Section 13.16.370, trap interceptor required at 1206 West Ocean Avenue. And we have a presentation by our City Utility Director first, and then we'll have the applicant speak. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and audience members. Um, before I start, I'd like to put back my finance director hat on, and there were a couple comments made by the audience earlier about the use of funds when we're in a deficit and having troubles with our general fund. The city's made up of several M Mr. Wilkie, different divisions. Mr. Wilkie, I would suggest that we re consider that at a later date and stick to the agenda item at the moment and we'll have that discussion at Fair the enough. end of the meeting. Okay. Um, this is the appeal by the Subway Restaurant for the utility directors ruling on the request for reconsideration regarding enforcement of uh, LMC Lombok Municipal Code regarding uh, traps and interceptors. This particular um, appeal has a couple nuances that are not like uh, a couple of the other ones that we had. Um, primarily, the building permit that was issued in 2014 for this uh, operation included the requirement to have a in-ground interceptor installed as part of the building improvements, and that was accomplished and um, signed off on once the building permit was final in 2018. Um, since that time, um, the interceptor had been tiled over and not used and subsequently taken out. Um, once the um, food service uh, surveys went out, this was discovered and the process began with a uh, conversation with the business owner to reinstall um, the interceptor as required by the building permit. Um, the staff report kind of goes in a little bit more detail about some of the, the steps were taken and some of the actions that occurred during this process. Um, it's really very much like what has happened in the past, a request for um, installation by the wastewater department, um, a request by the um, business owner to reconsider that, and then an appeal to the city council. Um, I will uh, stop there and give the uh, appellant a, a opportunity to speak or give you an opportunity to ask questions. Any questions for Mr. Wilkie before we turn it over to the applicant? Mr. Mosby. This plan that you have here, where on the plan is the interceptor? I couldn't identify that. So, uh, you have a way to put that on the overhead? He's, he's scratching to you. Do you, do you have a, also a signed off um, inspection sheet of a installation of the interceptor? I did not ask for that from the building di division. Do we have any um, proof of the installation of the interceptor? Did you provide um, any of that here? I did not provide it as part of the staff report, but they wouldn't have signed off in the building permit without that being done. So, and it was identified in in, in visits to the to the premises. Do, do you have the information that's showing the that it was identified on the plan or anything? 
I don't quite understand your question. Do you, do you have anything that shows that this was to be installed and was installed? Do you have any? Wh wh what, year, what year was this built again? The permit was issued in 2014 and it was signed off and final in 2018. I know it wasn't long ago sandwich shops weren't required to install them upon development. So that's what I'm asking is if you have some city documentation showing the installation was completed. Not with me. That would, I would have to get check with that with the building division. Okay. But to your question, this is the sink area, I believe. And from what I understand, um, this right here is the under the interceptor. That's in the the body of the bath, one of the bathrooms. So it's like labeled as G one. Is that what it is? I believe so. Yeah. And and where does it identify on the on the legend or anywhere there? What that is? I don't see that. No. It's it's a what? What did you say, Councilor Sturmey? I I because I'm I'm trying to figure this out here, where it was. I couldn't find it on a set of plans, mm -hmm. and it is. Do you see on the legend anywhere where it's identified? No, I, I do not. Not not as of what that number you just said. I believe you said G one. It looks more I, like I, water here to me. I'm not sure. I don't think G one is it. I think it's this. Most smaller. interceptors are square. I've, I've never had a deal with a round one. I'm not. Yeah. So. so what were you what were you pointing out again? Uh, along the wall line behind the sinks. So it's but, not identified in but, the plan then? Uh, I believe that, would, that looks like it might be it right there. That's a toilet. That one's a sink. That one in the middle? That would be a sink. That's the sink right there. That would be probably a mop sink. So. I'm not, so we don't, I, I'm just trying to find out where or what. Okay. So we don't, we have a set of plans, but we're not sure where it was identified. Oh, thank you. Any other questions for staff before we move to the applicant? Council Member Cordova. Well, this isn't a full set of plans, so it's hard to tell from just this scheme. I'd like to hear from the applicant first. Thank you, Mr. Wilkie. Ms. Becerra, please go ahead and step to the microphone. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Claudia Becerra, uh, representing the Subway starting uh, the franchisors for Subway on West Ocean. Uh, we operate 15 Subway locations on Central Coast. None of our other locations have ever been required to have a grease trap or a grease separator installed except Lompoc. Uh, when the West Ocean location was built and opened in 2015, there was a grease trap installed under the sink, not on the floor. It was not under the floor as stated in the staff report. Immediately, the grease trap began emitting terrible odor um, I remember the horrible smell in the store even after the grease trap was clean. We had complaints from our employees, but more importantly, uh, we had complaints from our customers. I'm sure uh, the customers wonder what kind of cleanliness issues we have, and the staff have uh, constantly explained the stinky grease trap problems to customers. Uh, within the first few months of opening a restaurant, Owner uh, Mr. Sarin met with Lompoc City staff um, on the issue on the disgusting smell from the interceptor. From our research, uh, we, found, we have learned that interceptors tend to stink with lower water flows and the lack of grease to be cut. City staff was sympathetic to the problem and the smell, and the city staff authorized us to remove the grease trap, which had had no grace. Although we were able to open in 2015, for some reason, our permit was never final until March 12, 2018. And when that final inspection was conducted, there was no mention by city staff of remove grease trap. The plan sheet in the staff report does not appear to show the under grease trap. 
Uh, you can imagine our surprise after paying um, to install the under sink grease trap and then paying to have it removed because it cut no grease and really stunk to be again asked to put on a back end. Uh, most of the pans we wash in our sink are from bread baking operation. All our, our food products come in ready to serve ba in bags. The only product we have uh, with any significant grease is pre-cooked bacon, which we reheat uh, on the on disposable paper sheet that goes in the in the trash. Unlike other daily operations, we this. Um, we dispense our sandwich dressing from the square bottles, so we have no pre uh, utensils. Our soup comes in a plastic bags and are put in a bag in the dispenser, which is thrown away and is empty with nothing to wash. Our serving process at this lower volume location is that a staff member makes the customer sandwich, discard their, their gloves, takes the customer payment, and then wash their hands and puts on new gloves. As a result, the bulk of um, the water use at this location is for hand washing and the customer restrooms. Putting in, a, then taking out the last grease trap costs us thousands of dollars and simply, simply proved that it cut no grease and was a stinky mess. Uh, we do not want to waste money again and then be back here with another appeal in a few months to take it out again. I want to say again uh, that we have never been required to install an interceptor or trap in any other 15 locations we franchise on the Central Coast from Lombok to Atascadero. And uh, please have love our appeal. Do you have any questions? Councilmember Cordova. So for clarification, um, you mentioned that when you opened the store in 2015, there was a grease trap interceptor underneath the sink, correct? Yeah. Now, I'm not sure if that was already there or we installed it just for this. Um, it was there. Okay. Thank you. And then also, um, when you went to remove it, um, are you saying that it was your ownership and a city official that discussed the process and um, was there a permit granted for the removal of that grease trap interceptor? Um, I just find out that today I, uh, the office was closed just to call them and check all the health department or city uh, reports to clarify that. But uh, uh, yeah, we removed it because the staff city, uh, the staff city like uh, was sympathy to, to remove it. Okay. Because it was not required. Okay, thank you. I mean, not necessary. No, no, no not required. Just clarifying. Councilmember Mosby. So in March of 2018, when you got your final, uh -huh. was the grease interceptor installed at that time? No. So it, are, it was no longer there? It was no longer okay. there. Okay. Did you ever, as the paper states here, it says you, you had one in the ground and you jackhammered it up and then you retiled? Did, did that ever happen? Mm, no. You, okay. So it says, did you have time? You read the whole staff report that they have here, right? Um, part of it? Part of it. Yeah, because it says you removed it, an access point was tiled over uh, in opposition to your final permit without obtaining required permit for removal. So that, you didn't jackhammer it out of the ground and then hide it and retile no, it? No. Okay. But you did get a final permit, then it wasn't in there. Yeah, correct. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Cordova. I have questions, but for Mr. Wilkie. All right, thank you, Ms. Vesetta. Mr. Wilkie, please return to the microphone. Mr. Wilkie, do we know why it took, uh, if the restaurant opened its doors Finally, in 2015, why did it take us so long to grant them a final until 2018? Do we know? So I'm not in the building department, so the only thing I can guess about that is that the uh, the turnover they've had in that department, but that's just a, I don't know. Okay. I really don't know. And is there a requirement, a procedure or a protocol that requires for them to have a final before opening their doors? Again, I'm not in the building department, so I, 
Does I, anybody I know? Really can't do that. No, we, well, we don't have anyone from building here tonight. Um, it'd be speculation on my part. I would really rather not do that. We can ask um, tomorrow with our building official. Okay, and um, the report, the staff report states that there was, um, there was, you know, um, uh, it talks about how they covered it up or it was on the floor and it was new tile was put on there how do how did we come to that conclusion how did we assess that to know for a fact that that's what happened well when the wastewater staff went in to do the inspection or visit the um, operations um, there was I believe a discussion that was occurred that said this is where it was so I don't know I wasn't part of that discussion I was not there at that the, when that was discussed. So I, that was also just speculation because I was not there, but the information I got back from my staff was that there was one and it was tiled over. Okay. And then, um, thank you, um, Brad. I, it would be my um, feeling that because we don't have all the information to make, in my opinion, a uh, a good rendering on this appeal that it be pushed to a to a to a later council date where we can get all the information to show if in fact this um, information is correct or not and why and, and answer some of the questions that that we have but that's just my opinion I, I'm not sure what the rest of the council feels about that councilmember Mosby yeah. do you do you have any reason to or any evidence to show um, at what the appellant was asking and stating that they had it under seek and then they removed it, but they signed off. Do you have anything to show that that didn't happen? I don't have anything to show that did or didn't happen, no. Okay. Um, you know, to the rest of the council, I think city staff had plenty of time to prepare to show us this information. Uh, they were working on this, it looks to me like for quite a while. What they did show us, they showed us a document that doesn't seem to show what they say happened. Um, I haven't heard that, you know, as per state law, you're supposed to have equipment that generates grease-laden waste. Um, I don't think Subway has equipment that generates grease-laden waste. Again, I think, um, I, you know, I'm full support of city staff in, in situations where they, they do have equipment as such. You have a deep fryer, without a doubt, you need an interceptor. Um, Mr. Wilkie, have, are you aware of any uh, plug drain lines uh, at this location? As I've said before on these particular instances, my interpretation of our NPDES permit is that the fog program of our SSMP is a component of, of that, which requires all food service establishments to have a grease trap or an interceptor. Okay, so are you, are you aware of any plug drain lines at that facility? Are you aware of any Because spills? of what I just said, the that evidence or not, or lack of evidence or proof of evidence is superseded by the fact that the SSMP requires all food service establishments. I, I'll ask one more time. Have. Are you aware of any plug drain lines at this facility? I'd have to check with wastewater collections. I'm not aware of anything right now. Okay. But I stand by what I just said about the SSMP being part of the NPDES permit okay. requiring all food service establishments to have a grease trap or interceptor. Thank you. So getting back to council, you know, the discussion that I'm having, if we have a, a facility, they have 15 other sandwich shops, and we're the only ones requiring them something, that if you're in a situation when these interceptors aren't working, meaning that they're not getting proper flow or getting fed, that they do gas off and they do cause issues. Um, I just believe city staff had ample time to, to show why this should be denied. I believe that they had the proper documentation showing, e even, the, even the signed off build sheet that they could have had there showing the permit, 
that it was installed. Something to show this, but I, I'm not seeing anything on what they did provide. I mean, um, you know, I'll let council continue to deliberate, but I think uh, that there, there aren't findings of fact showing that the, the necessitates. I don't think we need to spend more time and let the city continue to drag this on further. They had ample time to put this together. Um, and it seems to me like there's some misinformation that's stated here. And if they had this, if they had point of fact or proof that, that the tile was torn up and they, they removed an in-ground interceptor, you, you think they would have more than that than, than a hearsay statement? Before we continue or make a decision, I will remind council that we do need to take this to public comment. Council Member Cordova. I was just gonna say that um, I think the applicant though has also stated that uh, they did remove the grease interceptor that was there. Whether it was in the ground or not, I do believe that we should have had some kind of um, you know, formal documentation that shows that we were in fact aware that there was one there. Um, so I think in light of the fact that she said she didn't have the information needed to be able to prove that, that there was a discussion between the ownership and our city staff, I, I would like to see if in fact there was, or if, if they have any communication and allow staff to go back and see if they have any communication on that. But again, that's just my opinion. Councilmember Vega. I think we have a pattern here of uh, a little bit of overreach, I think. Uh, I understand the rules and regulations from wastewater, and I'd like to be re respectful of that, but as a sandwich shop that uh, is coming in with pre, everything's already in a bag, everything's already done, there's all throwaway, and a lack of evidence. This is the applicant's day in court, so to speak, uh, for their appeal, so uh, the lack the lack of preparation on the city part by not being able to prove uh, without a doubt so that we know that we're making the right decision here is uh, today's the day. So I really, uh, right now, I think I would have to support the applicant on their appeal process because uh, of all the, the evidence that's suggesting the floor hasn't been torn up. We don't have anything that says it has been. And uh, I understand with the rules and regulations, Mr. Wilkie, I get it. Uh, but consistency is an issue also. Um, a consistency on sandwich shops and restaurants that have nothing more than probably uh, rinsing gloves or mayonnaise is an issue. Um, so anyway, that's my public comment right now with the supporting evidence. Uh, no building department, no supporting documentation. Um, I tend to support the applicant. Thank you. Any more questions for staff or the applicant before I open it to public comment? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Wilkie. The floor is now open for public comment on this matter. Cut to the chase. This is another way to keep businesses out of Lompoc. This is another way to run Lompoc into the ground by being so unfriendly to businesses. But to top it off and have a report from the city that is inaccurate, that states inaccurate things right on the paper. It's my understanding it's a legal document. These are supposedly codes and laws that people get fined for, and we have city staff that falsified a document, we need to get to the bottom of what's going on and hold people accountable. It's not Hong Kong. It's not Beijing. It's the United States of America, and we need to get back on track. Help us. Thank you. Nick Nikolenko, resident of Lompoc. I stand with the owner operator of this restaurant, not only her restaurant, but other restaurants, all the other subways in town, PJ's Deli, Breadboard Deli, Blenders, Valley Juice, I'm sure even Subway, they have no use for these grease traps because they do not produce grease. So this 
is an example of government overreach and this law will deter businesses from coming to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, council members. When I read the uh, staff report on this appeal, I was very concerned because if the business had been had jackhammered up a floor and didn't have permission to do that, that certainly rises to an entirely different level, whether or not they have a need of a grease interceptor. So I took the opportunity to go over there because my understanding was that it was in the restroom floor. And I looked at the restroom floor and you know I've been in the business of liquidating restaurants for a lot of years and I'm pretty familiar at looking at things and understanding what happened. And I can tell you with a great deal of certainty that that restroom floor has never been jackhammered up. And they were nice enough to let me walk in the back and look in the kitchen where that separator would normally have been in the floor if it was gonna be inside the building. If you look at the drawing, you'll see that there's a point of connection for the sewer that's identified that's toward the rear of the kitchen area. So it would have to be inboard in the building from that point of connection and there was no tile in the kitchen that had been jackhammered up. I did speak to the manager who was there, um, and I said, hey, you know, what do you know about this? And she said, well, there's, you know, I came in a year or so after it opened, so I don't know anything about it. I heard that it was here and that it stunk real bad and it got taken out from under the sink. And so, the, you know, the, if the staff came, staff came to the conclusion that it was under the floor, I don't know how they drew that conclusion because there is no one there that could have had that remembrance because they didn't work there. Uh, the three icons that you see, or the four icons you see in the restroom, the one on the right as you're looking at it is the toilet, uh, the one in the middle is the urinal, and the one on the left is the sink. The round circle in the middle is the turning radius for a wheelchair. I know all these things because I had to draw a set of plans like that to put a handicapped restroom in my building some years ago. So um, I can say with 99.99% uh, certainty that that floor was never tore up. And I would, can't think of any reason that they would lie about having an under sink interceptor. And clearly they had problems with it. And so have several other businesses that put them in in Lompoc and I think one of them's about to tell you about it. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mayor and City Council members, uh, Stacy Lothorpe, Southside Coffee Company. I um, just wanted to give you a little insight as to uh, the grease trap. This week, I had a surprise visit inspection from the water district to come and measure the grease in. Uh, the new grease trap that we had, they called and let me know when they would be by, and that was fine. They were kind enough not to come during my business, my busiest time, but they came in with their measure, and um, I was proud to have my little file ready with my documentation of the day, the hour, the where, and how I disposed of my of my. Um, interceptor and I had it all ready to go and nobody wanted it. <laughs> they just wanted to measure the amount of grease in my grease trap. And uh, they thanked me for my time and they headed out the door and I raced to stop them to ask them what their findings were. And I produce, I process differently than Subway does. I use more water than they do. I don't have liners for my soup. Um, I do use uh, an aioli spreading sauce that we use quite a bit. We do wash the containers out. And uh, my report came out completely negative. No grease. Hello, I'm a professional food, pers food service person. I started cooking in 1984. The grease trap they're talking about would have been a concrete box. They're usually like this. So it was probably jackhammered out. It was sitting on top of the tile. Okay, the places you're talking about, hers, Subway, they don't produce enough grease for fog. 
I've been dealing with fog forever. It's a federal mandated law. They don't produce enough. As far as I'm concerned, these little shops like this deserve to get themselves a little buy on that. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll bring the discussion back to council. Councilmember Starbuck. Now, just a couple of comments here. It seems like here we are again, and we've got more coming. This is what a mass mailing generates, it appears, that we just contact everybody that sells a piece of bread and we've required them to install an interceptor. Uh, I find it interesting that now we have the only subway probably in the state that's gonna have an interceptor. We currently have the honor of having the only Baskin and Robbins in the state with an interceptor. So we are, we are at the front of what we're doing, that's for certain. And what I get to looking at these plans, as hard as they are and small as they are, there is no interceptor on the plans. If it was under the sink there, it was probably for Okisushi, the Japanese restaurant that used to be there, not Subway. Personally, I think it's a crock. I'm sorry that we have to waste everybody's time. I wish the staff would make a decision on common sense and not this frickin' mass mailing generated document that's gonna have to be updated soon. Councilmember Vega. I'd like to make a motion that we grant the applicant's appeal. Um, I don't see the supporting evidence that should be here on, uh, on, on either or side, but it seems like it's supporting in favor of the applicant. So that's my motion. I'll second you. Council Member Vega, as we have done with all of these appeals, uh, I'd request that you add to your motion a direction to uh, the city attorney's office to bring back a, resol a written resolution um, with findings that uh, will take the council statements tonight to make findings uh, for upholding the appeal. I'd like to make that uh, amendment to my proposal here as stated by the city attorney. Yeah, I'll go ahead and second the attorney's motion. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion? Councilmember Mosby. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, yeah, I agree with uh, the motion, but uh, you know, people are innocent till proven guilty. And I think in this case, the city had enough time to back up their statements and nothing that came from the city staff in my eyes shows that what the, uh, uh, the applicant is saying is wrong. And the point of fact that, that she states that she got a signed permit without an interceptor, that's the point of time when you move forward. If an interceptor is installed and you pulled it out before the, the finalization of the, of, of the permit, and I don't see it on the plans, then I'd say that's the baseline. That's the point where you start and you move forward. So I, I you know, was, was curious about this, and when it comes out that they didn't jackhammer something out of the ground. Uh, I, I just kind of really concerned what staff is, uh, uh, if, if this was to be true, I would have liked to seen some documentation to their statements, but I don't think they've given us anything for me to believe um, uh, the utility director over the applicant. Thank you for that. For clarity, I will once again be voting against um, anyone getting a waiver. This is a federal law that has been mandated that says food service establishment. We have an opportunity to evaluate our own ordinance and how we're applying it, and the only motion that came before council regarding this was a discussion to extend the window of time. What we really should be doing is reassessing the entire ordinance. If we are creating a scenario that continues to cause appeals, there is a problem with the ordinance, and we are not addressing the actual issue. So for that reason, I won't be supporting the approval of the appeal because we have not actually solved the real problem and looked at the actual ordinance and looked at our actual plan and seen if we have the ability to redefine what a food service establishment is. That is for clarity for the public. Council Member Mosby. Well, actually, 
the, what it is is the interpretation of our SSMP plan that we have and the definition of what a restaurant is. And the previous utility director looked at it differently than what the current utility director is. So it's a matter of opinion on this. And we will, I believe, have a, the plan coming before us here shortly. And I have discussed with the city attorney for at that time the options that we have to get this aligned both with state law and, and with what we see here publicly. Thank you for your opinion. Um, we will now move forward on a roll call vote because of our system being down. Counts, uh, please do so, Madam Clerk. Council Member Mosby? Aye. Council Member Starbuck? Aye. Council Member Cordova? Aye. Council Member Vega? Yes. Mayor Osborne? No. And that passes 4-0, 4-1-0. Our next agenda item is council requests. Discussion concerning formation of a nonprofit organization to fund city projects from our city manager. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is a council request that we had first talked about back in March of 2019. Uh, the question raised at that time, or the, what was brought up was actually doing a, concerning the formation of a nonprofit organization in which to help fund different projects in the city through different grants that some of these, they're called NGOs, non-governmental organizations. They can't give a grant to a city, but they can give it to a nonprofit. So um, discussion was had about what were the costs to create such a nonprofit. Um, again, one of the benefits, we're, we're transitioning our public information officer over into grants writing um, with the different training. What she'll be able to do is then, with this nonprofit, if you so choose to create it, to look at more than just federal and state grants. She can go after other grants that are out there through these non-governmental organizations. Um, so the, co the question at that time was, what would it cost? And it is actually a minor, a relatively minor amount. It's about $1,300, rounding that off. Uh, most of them are filing fees, Secretary of State filing fee, IRS filing fee, Registry of Charitable Trust filing fee, and then we also added in two hours of city attorney review. So. That's how we came up with the $1,300 um, one-time cost to get this started. Um, the only other type would be um, the process, while it does have some costs attached, it's not complicated, can be accomplished by staff without the use of a consultant. Um, the only other staff time might be if the council decides to ask staff to either um, support, and sur support the board or actually be serving on this nonprofit board. That will answer any questions. Councilmember Vega. Uh, Mr. Troop, uh, the impact or the information that other, any other cities, are they going after grants like this and have they created nonprofit organ, uh, within their own entities to support city staff going after grants like this? Do we have any of that information uh, here there in Santa Barbara, San Luis counties? I, I did not reach out for that part of it. Okay. But but there are many different grants out there. Some, some aren't very large because of the, the foundations will give out smaller grants, but it is an opportunity for us to reach out. I can see if there's any other cities that have formed a nonprofit. Um, I think in every other, uh, everything we do, we always do it and we wanna see if we're first in or first out or we have any information just to create a nonprofit, uh, just to create another one because we have other in, uh, nonprofits already connected to the city that we could utilize that don't have to be for these NGO grants specifically. So I just hate to create another entity from which we can't control because of staff and whatever. Yes, it gives them another tool to go after different grants, but I'm not sure that it would be uh, beneficial enough to go after that. that same I, can, I can ask yeah, my I peers. think right now with that information, I think without having the background of who else is doing this and who else has prevailed and who else has been successful in, in retaining any of the money, uh, it may be a waste of time if we don't have that information. For your information, Councilmember Vega, the City of Santa Maria does have its own nonprofit, and that is one of the ways they are resourcing funds outside of government grants to fund some of their youth programs, gang violence, and uh, parks. Well, thank you for that information. I think I was addressing the City Manager, but thank you. Councilmember Mosby. I chaired a nonprofit for four years and understanding the complexities of it and such. Um, 
it seems to me there's going to be a lot of staff time involved, and I, I imagine we're probably, because of the potential liability component of the city, that we're going to have to have some legal component involved uh, at the meetings. Are, are, are you aware of? I'm going to look at the city attorney to see if he thinks there should be. It's not required to have an attorney there, but I do know other cities uh, that my firm works for that have these nonprofits. Uh, they do have someone from my office at those meetings. And, uh, you know, I, it can get, uh, the meetings can be long, and I'm sure you guys bill by the hour, right? We do bill by the hour. I don't know how long the meetings are because I don't do okay. those. Some, some of those can be part of the grant process though, so we can recoup some. Part of the admin fees, we can mm -hmm. service out of that. that. That's my concern, especially at this time, you knowing that we're, we're thin. I mean, I know grants can help offset, right. but maybe we should uh, think about this in a year after we get the positions lined up on there and we see where we are. Maybe we've got a little extra money in the coffers right now. I need to uh, get in a position. Um, you know, it, we've, got it, we've got a good format here. You've got a lot of good information on how we can get there. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe we should walk a little bit before we run, just thinking for the, the, the money component, if nothing else. Councilmember Cordova. Um, that was going to be my question, is how do we plan to um, pay for the staff and the legal, that would, uh, the legal requirement that would be in place to be able to effectively manage the nonprofit um, because if it's coming out of the um, grant funds then I feel like it really um, defeats the purpose of going out there and getting funds administrative fees for any nonprofit organization can get very costly um, I'm more in favor of, of a nonprofit organization getting funds for what it's purpose is or for the, what it's intended to do, but if it starts eating away at the funds into administrative fees, then I feel like it defeats the purpose of what our uh, intention would be for our community. If, if I may, Mayor, I can, I'll talk with the city attorney since he has different cities that do this and we can ask what, um, what are the different costs they have seen, you know, from their nonprofits. Council Member Starbuck. Just a couple of quick questions. So when we apply for grants and all, are we competing against other cities or are we competing with other nonprofits in it's, the area? It could be both. It could be, it's, without the nonprofit, we have no opportunity to put in a competition for that. So this allows us to enter a, another area that we have never been able to get into before because we can only go after the state and federal type government. Um, so yeah, the government grants, we don't need to have a nonprofit for right. So now what we're doing is we're gonna step into the to the non-governmental, non-profit world and try and take money out of the non-profits that are existing out in the community now then is what happens if this goes forward. Yes, but for also for a public benefit though. Right, well everything that a non-profit does should be for a benefit right. of somebody, so. Any additional questions for staff before we turn it over to public comment? Seeing none, thank you. We will now open the floor for public comment on this matter. If you would like to speak to it, please step forward. Mayor, Council, I'm Steve Bridge. Uh, we looked at this in the uh, Parks and Recs. In fact, we were moving down that path uh, when I was on that commission. And one of the biggest issues that we had not resolved by the time we got to where we got to was who actually controls the board. You're gonna need a board of directors. And at least in my opinion, what I looked at with the intent of what they were, uh, the staff was trying to do, it would be a board of directors, mainly of city employees. Um, so you will have to staff those and you will have to pay for that. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying 1300 bucks is just the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. So you might want to consider before you get there, what is the structure of this thing you're setting up so that, you know, you just don't create another community nonprofit, which there are several out there that are more than willing to work with the city on going after grants. Thank you.
I see this as competition for existing nonprofits and their grants. They already have enough competition. We don't need the city coming up with their own nonprofit organization or whatever this would be competing against existing nonprofits for these same grants. These grants are already spread thin. There's already costs. These existing nonprofits could get less money. And if they get less money, they may not be able to do what they do already. So I think we need to focus on our existing nonprofits first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Once again, on behalf of the Parks Foundation, we would just be delighted to help the city form a committee and use our existing nonprofit for any parks purposes. When this originally came up, the discussion was about a foundation within the city to raise fund for park and recreation programs. And the catalyst for it, as the mayor mentioned, was a program in Santa Maria where they operate the vending machines for the city and they do a large fundraiser once a year through a food event and then they apply for some peripheral grants. But their principal funding mechanism is this rather large event, which I think is brilliant, and we just haven't got anybody here to do it yet. Um, and, you know, I've said, well, you know, we're here, we'd like to have you, but if you, don't want, to, if you want to do it on your own, I suppose that's okay. But then I was reading the staff report of the March 19th meeting, and something caught my eye that really made me concerned, and it said, now the plan is changed and the staff is now recommending, and I quote, however, a global nonprofit corporation could possibly fund those interests and many more. And so I wanted to share with you, I just was sitting with my keyboard and I was typing up a list of all of the foundations that currently serve the city and the people of the city and provide things that the city can't provide. So we have a police foundation, a fire foundation, a library foundation, we actually have two, the Festival Association to put on events, the High School Alumni Association that puts on events, the Lompoc Seniors Club that puts on events because the Senior Center doesn't have the money to put them on, the Lompoc Theater Group, the Lompoc Civic Theater, the Pops, the Fallen Warriors Memorial, the YMCA, the Lompoc Historical Society, the La Parisma Mission Docents, the Boys Club, the Girls Club, the Boys and Girls Club, I'm sorry, the Bark and Park, the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Cub Scouts, the Campfire Kids, Meals on Wheels, the Experimental Aircraft Association that does the Cub Fly-In, the Rotary that does a very large event once a year and funds a big project, thank you very much to them, the Lions Club, the Knights of Columbus, the Elks Lodge, the Masons, the Shriners, the Odd Fellows, the Rape Crisis Center, the Lompoc Trails Committee, Catholic Charities, Good Samaritan Services, the nonprofits that sell fireworks and fund half of our stadium fireworks show, the Chamber of Commerce, the Riverbed Bike Skills Park, a nonprofit for every youth sport, and I couldn't list them all because I wouldn't get it in three minutes, the school booster clubs and the PTAs, and their 52 churches and the community programs, including feeding the homeless and all the other things. So there's 150 in Lompoc. I can't imagine why we want to have the city compete with them. And I also, brought along a copy of the staff report from a while back, and I want you to look at it where it says, we really don't want this to appear to be a city foundation. We do not want this to appear to be a city foundation because it may restrict the amount of funds we get. Well, if we don't want it to be a, appear to be a city foundation, then it certainly shouldn't be. I'm still ready, willing, and able to help the city start a committee. Tomorrow would be a good day. And fund their parks programs. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we will close public comment and bring it back to discussion by council. Personally, this is not designed to compete with those that are always doing amazing jobs for their very specific missions. This nonprofit would be focused on city-related matters that we are short on funding. As Councilmember Mosby has pointed out, 
He wants to solve our problems with having grants and a grant writer. Right now, a grant writer can only apply for state, county, state, and federal programs. That's all our grant writer will be able to apply for. If we have a city nonprofit that can apply for competitive grants to address equipment, infrastructure, parks, youth program, gang violence, we become a participant. We can partner with those existing nonprofits and be multiple partners on an application and improve our chance of winning those. But you need someone willing to write those grants. And if we have a staff grant writer who also has a nonprofit associated, then we are able to look at more funding and compete for it. So I personally think we should move forward on that. I think, yes, we will need to discuss what does the board look like? Who's the membership of the board? When are the meetings held? What is the cost of that? But again, staff isn't gonna move forward with those details until we have affirmed the concept of putting it together. That's how I feel about it, especially if we're gonna have a grant writer. I want that position to be able to go after more than just the limited government grants that exist and the competition that exists from that. Councilmember Vega. Um, I agree, the grant writing position is something that's badly needed and sorely needed by, by the city. I don't agree that we should explore other entities and grants that we have no knowledge of as far as any success rates. Uh, it appears that you have a little bit more information than city staff on this, so I applaud you and I appreciate that. It's just that I don't believe we have enough background here to say, hey, we're gonna throw this grant writer in who's going through training as we speak we don't know what the successes are going to be, even with the federal and state uh, grants, as we know. So what are we trying to do? Are we gonna water down the process or are we gonna require more staff to run this nonprofit from which admin will increase? I don't believe that we're gonna run any nonprofit or any other meeting or any other entity that's gonna be out there to obtain grants that's not gonna require legal services as a background. Everything is being done by city staff, I think that we're uh, we're not acknowledging the actual cost, as, as our city attorney said, in many cases, in many cities, uh, they have legal behind them. Councilmember Cordova. So, um, although I support um, us being able to go out there and, and, and find grants and find money that will improve um, the quality of life for our residents and the many causes that Lompoc has, um, the, the staff report, and unless I'm understanding this incorrectly, the staff report says that the recommendation is um, direction from staff to proceed with forming a California nonprofit organization. It, is that what is intended tonight? Sorry, that was the intent was, the question back in March was what would it cost to create this, so this was really just a quick follow-up to the, the report back in March. So um, what we would then have to do is, if you said yes, bring back more of the information, um, we would then have, with the help of our attorney, we would come back with all of the documentation. Council would have to decide who sits on it. It's not, a staff would not be sitting on the council, or the, the committee, the board. Um, council would decide who wants to actually be on that. Um, We'd have to get the bylaws, anything else you want to throw in there. We'd, we'd have to bring this all back to the council again. This was just a follow-up to the March meeting on what would the cost be to create a nonprofit, and it was minimal cost. Okay, Un understood. Um, but that would be more information rather than making a decision today to proceed with actually forming it. I you know, Correct. Uh, two no, different this, things. I think the way the, the thought process in March was, well, what does this cost? come back with what that cost is, and then that opened up for the next go-round of discussions to bring back more information. Now that we know here's the cost of approximately $1,300, we then bring back all the other information for the council then decide, do you want to continue with it? So I will um, make a motion that we um, proceed with getting more information so that uh, the council can have all the information up front. Um, and not necessarily go with the staff recommendation of proceeding with actually forming this California nonprofit organization. And I would agree and give her a second on that as long as we're not voting to move forward and form this 
nonprofit organization at this time without supporting uh, more supporting information as requested. Councilmember Mosby. Yes, just as discussion for your first and your second. Um, uh, one area where I've had people actually contact me wanting to give, want to know if the city did have a nonprofit ID number. It makes it easier for people, not just for grants, but for people to give. Um, so just as, again, continuing the discussion with what you guys wanting more information, maybe the city attorney could bring some information from some of the other places, what, what it costs um, for the legal component, because I do believe in protection of the city that, that you're going to have to have legal involved and maybe some of the time frame that they have, how many times they meet a month or a year, whatever it is, and, and some of the cost. Because if we're gonna have city staff on it, it's gonna be city staff time. So we can get some rough annual estimate that comes along with the information that they're asking. Okay, real quick point that Councilmember Mosby made is very, very good. When someone passes away or they do something, a lot of times from the IRS standpoint, it's much, much easier for the estate to have a nonprofit to donate to than to a city. It, it does make a, a big difference at that point. So we have a motion on the floor to proceed with staff bringing back additional information about what the structure would look like, what additional costs might, and what other entities have done this and their success model. And we have a second. Any further questions or discussions? I'd like Councilmember Vega. Yeah, I have another question there, uh, Mr. Uh, City Manager. Um, basically, I think with the process that we move, that we come back with, and, and the information, it would be not just for the NGO grants. I see. I see that uh, Councilman Mosby brought up another reason. That, hey, if somebody wanted to pass on their home or right. or car or estate to the city, I can see that. But uh, I wouldn't like to see it just for a single purpose. You know. Yeah, you're correct. I mean, once it's set up, it's not, it's, it wouldn't be set up to only use it for that because you, ha you have the full venue of, the, of a nonprofit to use it for other, other areas. It, this was originally started to try and work with our new grants writer to um, give more opportunity, but having the nonprofit, it does. It allows someone to donate yeah, I'd like, I'd like to see information that would generate just more of a nonprofit for the benefit of somebody who wanted to get some sort of uh, relief for donating or something from the city and be able to write it off as a taxable write-off, I think, would be better than trying to fund the position or fill in the position of grant writer right now. I think she's going to have her hands full with state and federal grants. So I think under that singular thought process, it may grow into this. Uh, but at this time, I just wanted to make that comment. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion or comment? City Clerk. Councilmember Starbuck. Yeah, just real quick, uh, one of the things I'd kind of like to have happen here is that the council doesn't sit on this board or become involved in the board like the, the March uh, staff report listed some of the options where no council on the board. If that would be an agreeable with the rest of the council on that. Well, that. That's a decision that I think we'd like you to make when we bring all the information back. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll sort of plagiarize some of that report and add to it, and it'll have the different options so you can pick and choose which one. City Clerk. So I just want to be clear on what the motion is, and it was given by uh, Councilmember Cordova to proceed for a future meeting staff to return with structure information um, of what a board may look like, um, estimates of annual costs from other agencies, and how often a, a board may meet. Was there anything else? Can I add something if I can, since she's asking? Councilmember Vega, you may, and if Councilmember Cordova accepts your adjustment. Sure. I'd like information on the success rate of any other nonprofit here within the, the county, uh, Santa Barbara and San Luis County, who else is operating under that same nonprofit, guys, to see what the awards are. You brought up the NGO grants. Uh, what are the grants that are available out there currently, and, and is it worth staff time to go after them? Okay, if they're only 50000 or 40000 or 30000 and we spend uh, a year to go after something and we don't get it, or we don't prevail, I mean, we'd like to make sure that it's worth our time and worth the grant writer's time. 
if Councilwoman Cordova is okay with that. Yeah. So you also want that report to include success rates for all nonprofit agencies within Santa Barbara County? I believe it was for other cities that have a nonprofit. Yeah, it was for other cities that are here locally within Santa Barbara County and San Luis that are, yeah. Uh, okay. Enough clarity for you? All right. Seconder would need to second that as well. And Sorry. Mr. Vega, who made the addition I made to a the second minute, had, and a third. I, I, and then got acceptance from the initial motion, so I think we're all clear on that one. Good? Okay. Now that you have your notes finished and we've confirmed everything, if you're ready for a voice vote, we, we will proceed. Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Councilmember Starbuck? Aye. Councilmember Cordova? Aye. Councilmember Vega? Yes. Mayor Osborne? Yes. Passes 5-0. The next item is council request number five, city council consideration of revisions to policy regarding public disclosure of the names of persons making code enforcement complaints presented by our city attorney, Mr. Malave. Mayor and council, on July 2nd, 2019, at the city council meeting, I presented a, a presentation regarding the city's code enforcement complaint policy and specifically regarding whether the names of code enforcement complainants are released when someone in the public requests that name in a Public Records Act request. Uh, I explained that except in emergency circumstances, the city has a policy of not releasing any names of people who make code enforcement complaints. Uh, the City Council directed me to develop a two-tiered system that uh, we could use to amend the policy so that uh, lower level code enforcement violations, um, we, what staff would do is release the names of those complainants, but more serious violations that are immediate threats to public health and safety, um, the complainant's name would still not be disclosed. So I've done that on page two of the staff report. Uh, as I just explained, there are really the criteria that I developed for the council's consideration is whether the violation is a serious and immediate threat to public health and safety, public health or safety. I've listed a number of examples there in the table on page two. So lower level violations where the complainant's name would be disclosed pursuant to a request. Examples are weeds and landscaping, accumulation of junk, trash, and debris, uh, building aesthetics like chipping paint or broken windows, fence, <clears throat> fence violations, inoper inoperable vehicles or vehicles parked on lawns, um, building and zoning code violations, unless it creates a serious and immediate threat to public health and safety, noise violations, and any other violation that's not a serious and immediate threat to public health or safety. And on the other, on the right side of the chart, we have examples of what are serious and immediate threats to public health or safety, where the complainant's name would not be disclosed pursuant to a request by the public. Those are unsafe buildings, fire hazards, dangerous housing conditions like no heat or water or plumbing, public exposure to hazardous materials, illegal discharges into the sewer or stormwater system, uh, open trenches, abandoned refrigerators, uh, open and unfenced wells or pools, um, obstructions on the streets or highways, and the catch-all again, any other violation that's a serious threat to public health or safety and we understand that we cannot um, encapsulate all possible violations in a list so we do have those catch-alls and i would also um, recommend that if the council were going to adopt this policy that there be some type of appeal process um, sorry that the city manager would have the final say in 
uh, determining whether a complaint is a lower level violation or a serious and immediate threat to public health or safety, because there does need to be someone who makes that final call. So uh, the recommendation tonight is for the council to consider this new code enforcement complaint um, name release policy and give direction to staff on whether you'd like to amend the policy. Uh, the action you take tonight will be final. We don't need to bring anything back to amend this policy because it is uh, an unwritten policy and we will uh, proceed with the council direction. However, the council directs staff. So I'm available for questions um, and that concludes the staff report. Council Member Vega. Jeff, I think it, it, looks, it looks good. Thank you so much, okay, for the work if you put in as far as for a template. Um, I think what's happened here is I've had reports here of people that are, have abused some of the complaint process in retaliation to some uh, of businesses when they're not happy or uh, tenant, uh, tenants unhappy. You know, sometimes anonymous complaints can go uh, askew. You know, we've, I've seen that in... Uh, seen that many times so what we're trying to do is make sure everybody's on has both feet on the ground and they're being straightforward uh, it's always a good policy I think to speak to your neighbor whoever when you when it if it is a neighbor complaint to see if you can resolve this first but I think I think we're trying to make sure that everyone's uh, knows that we don't want frivolous complaints we don't want city to have waste of time and code enforcement to have to uh, go and enforce frivolous claims just because someone's unhappy about something. Thank you. Councilmember Mosby. I'd just like to mirror the comments. I think you captured what we were looking for and, and um, thank you for the report. Any other questions for the city attorney before we open it to the public comment? Seeing none, thank you. The floor is now open for public comment on this report. Mayor, Council, Steve Bridge, resident. Um, code enforcement is an important issue for Lompoc. Over the last few years, it has been abused. Certain parties have carried on vendettas. They've filed anonymous complaints, and sometimes it's believed they've even used false names. I think all of us are aware of that. Some complaints have come in with as little as an email. So. I don't know if that's a complaint, but in addition, the staff's repeatedly stated to the council that our system is complaint driven and the statistics do not seem to bear that out. So I took a year's complaints from last April to this April. There are about 500 code violations. I shouldn't call them code violations, code complaints. Over 170 of those were what I would call walk around complaints. It's where the staff goes and walks around and looks for something. Over 120 were weed abatement items. About 30 were no permit items. And about 20 were the inf infamous grease traps items. Another 10 or so were storm water. While all of those I'm sure are legitimate, it's about 70% staff created. So it's kind of a stretch to say it's only when people complain. So I strongly support the elimination of anonymous complaints and I believe the complaint should be fully documented. And if a complaint cannot be documented and signed, it should be rejected. I didn't quite understand the last comment made here, which was it's an unwritten policy. I don't know what that is. We either have a policy or we don't. And the other only other suggestion I would make is that no complaint generated by staff or city official should be allowed to be anonymous. We can't have city officials out there with their own private vendettas and then the city officials get to say, oh, we think it's fire or safety or something. So I think you should at a minimum say that city staff has to put their name on any complaint. Releasing names will <clears throat> open up vendettas and 
neighbors reporting on each other because now they'll have a name of somebody who reported them for little, almost insignificant things like lawn care or a car is too loud or parking too long or whatever. And that'll only open up reporting back and forth amongst neighbors. So I like the idea to keep it anonymous because that way it helps tone down the frivolous complaints and the back and forth between neighbors and these complaints. If somebody finds out who reported them, it could turn into physical altercations over you reported this, so I'm going to come over to your house and we're going to settle this. And we don't need any of that in this community. There's enough, there's enough um, not getting along this community as it is. We don't need more added to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll close public comment and bring it back to discussion by council. Councilmember Vega. I'd like to make a motion to move forward with um, this agendized item as presented by the city attorney. Um, and, and again, I do agree that city staff should have to go along with policy as laid out just like anyone else. So if it's a city staff generated complaint, um, it's okay, put your name down. We're, we've got to move forward and, and deal with it. And also that the policy would also include them in it being a written uh, policy so someone can backtrack and trace. We've had different, uh, we've had so many people in making movements here within the departments through the years. You know, we've had these gaps in time where somebody's left and we can't trace this and trace that or we can't really see what's happened from 2015 to 2018 because uh, depending on the department, uh, we've had people leave, come and go. So I think if it's in writing, it can be in the file and we can backtrack and trace it. So that's my motion. Turn your light off. Are you, are you, thank you. Council Member Mosby. I'll second it. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion or questions for? I have a question. Yes, City Attorney. Uh, so just to be clear, the motion is to approve the proposed new policy in the staff report? Yes, sir. Okay. Along with those uh, additions that I had in there, uh, as far as city staff to be included, and, uh, and then I, I got you, you can't put everything in a box. Yeah. So I don't know how we're going to do I that. Under, as I understood the additional comments that you made about having any complaint need to be written with a name, uh, that's already the policy, and um, so. And I and I also included city staff to be part of the policy just for transparency. Right. Um, that way, everyone's documented. Hey, they're still going to write the complaint because it is a valid violation. So I don't see there being an issue there. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Any more clarity, Councilmember Starbuck? Yeah, just for clarification, are we going to let the city manager have the determination of what we would define as a lower level violation or a serious and immediate threat as the staff report? Is that? I think I'm okay with that. Okay. Any additional questions, comments? Seeing none, uh, city clerk, call for vote. Councilmember Mosby? Aye. Councilmember Starbuck? Aye. Councilmember Cordova? Aye. Councilmember Vega? Yes. Mayor Osborne? Yes. And that passes 5 0. Item number six is appeals procedure in the Lompoc Municipal Code. And our city attorney will return for that discussion. Mayor and Council, uh, this is the last item tonight, and although the staff report is rather long, my verbal staff report is going to be brief. 
Um, at the March 19th meeting, the council requested to have a report on all of the appeals procedures that are in our municipal code. Uh, the written staff report lists, we've scoured the municipal code and found all of those appeal procedures and the written staff report lists 10 pages of them. I'm not going to go through every single one tonight, but they are in writing right there. So I'm just going to um, maybe summarize and say um, that there are some appeals that go to a mid-level appeal before it gets to the city council, such as an appeal by, well, these uh, grease trap appeals, for instance. The first appeal is to the utility director. The utility director then makes a decision and then if the uh, appellant is not happy, they can appeal again to the city council. That also happens in the planning department where the planning director makes a decision. The applicant can appeal to the planning commission and then if not happy with the planning commission's decision, uh, the applicant can appeal to the city council. Sometimes there are appeals where they do not come to the council and the city manager or a hearing officer is the final, makes the final decision for the city and the applicants or the appellants next step then is to file a lawsuit uh, if they are unhappy with the final decision from the city. So I hope you've all had a chance to review the staff report. I am available for questions. The staff recommendation tonight is simply to review this report and provide any direction that you'd like to provide to staff about the appeal processes. So that concludes the staff report. Thank you. Council Member Starbuck. Yeah, Jeff, one of the things I noticed, like you say, there's 10 pages of various appeals here. Some are very complex for a citizen to come in here and look through the whole municipal code to figure out if he even has the option of an appeal, et cetera. I think some of the intent on this council request, if I recall, was how do we inform somebody that they have an appeal process if they don't agree with the decision that most of the attitude is, oh, God, the city said I have to do it, so I just have to live with it. Uh, is there a way we could standardize some of these reporting times and make it where if there's a correspondence that's sent to somebody, there would be a paragraph automatically included that says, if you do not agree with this decision, you may appeal this within, because I don't think we notify anybody when we send them letters or paperwork that they do have an appeal option. Yes, because the different sections of the code were all adopted at different times, it's kind of scattered as to when the code says it's required to notify the person that there's an appeal process. Sometimes it does say that in the code, it's required to notify them. Sometimes it doesn't say that. Um, the wastewater division, for example, recently has heard loud and clear from council that even though it's not required to notify the property owner of the appeal process that the council would like them to do that. And so they're starting to do that now. Um, You can direct staff that in any communications with persons when there's an appeal that's available that we will put that notice to them in the letter or any written communication with them and then staff will do that. Uh, alternatively, if you would like to amend all these sections of the code to require that that notice about the appeal process be given, we can do that. Um, it, it's not a very complex thing, but it just be a little bit of time to add that into all of these. Uh, Maybe we sections. get a grant to do that then. But <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I'm not sure what the answer I'm fishing for here is, but I mean, we've seen various appeals, and obviously the grease trap. We've seen one about building, and I, I think that citizens are becoming more aware that there are options above what the letter tells them, and I'm just not sure how we can include that or make it routine, so to speak. We can add it into the rules, or we can just, as staff, we can take direction from council to put it in all of our letters from now on. If I may, Mayor, Council Member Starbuck, is uh, we can, I can bring that up at my next department head meeting, and Jeff did a great job putting this together. We have basically a template here, and we'll just make sure that everybody, if they're sending out a building violation notice, 
they, they note in there that here's what it says, or so whatever it might be, we can do that. Councilmember Mosby. There's a couple in here that, that don't have any date or time limit in here, like the unreinforced masonry building code. And maybe it's in the code itself. Is that what it? No, actually a lot of those building code type appeals, like the appeal that we heard a couple council meetings ago about the um, footing, um, the footing design. Um, the building code says that an applicant can just appeal and it doesn't give a timeline, it doesn't have a fee, and that's why we were forced, well, that's why the council heard the appeal from Mr. Holsey on that footings design, even though that decision was made back in 2016. Um, so the building code allows you to create deadlines or fees, but we haven't created any in Lompoc as of right now. Okay, um, I think it'd be a lot easier for you and city staff if we try to get this, because I mean, there's, you know, everything from, you know, whatever it says here, uh, adequate time to 10 days to 15 days, 14 days, uh, 10s and 15s, 30 days. And it doesn't really, it just has days, so it doesn't necessarily mean working days. So that can be complicated. If it's over Christmas, you might potentially have a lot says, less days. And uh, If it says days, it means calendar days. And if the deadline falls on a holiday, we would knock it over to the next business day. But you're right that if, if it's a 10-day appeal period and all of those 10 days are during the holidays, um, there's not a lot of time for the public to communicate with city staff. And I just think it would be nice that if we actually put this together, and I think it'd be a lot easier for you, or as staff, if, it, if we gave it a 20 or 30 days. Now, I know um, we might want to do something different when it comes to uh, um, the Planning Commission and, and a project being approved. It might have a 10-day for appeal on the project being appealed. If it's denied, then uh, got a 30-day appellate on something like that. And in, in today's complexities and such, Many times they're spending a lot more time putting together um, the case and giving an, a, a person trying to file appeal getting 10 days. In today's times, it takes, sometimes it can take a little while to get the money, uh, to book a lawyer, or whatever it might be, or study what's, what, what you need to do. Um, I'm sure you spend a bunch of time putting this together and hopefully we can get something easier for all the staff. Like the city manager says, I think we have a good template here. Um, I would like to see this posted somewhere or, or you know accessible f for the public as well as um, like it was said I feel a council member that it's available when we're when we're filing a complaint this is on the back it explains to people the process and gives them their their next step to due process mm -hmm. so I, you know I think the uh, city attorney for putting together a report and uh, see what we can come up with thank you council member Cordova mr. Malavi in the Staff report, the recommendation is um, to um, have the city council review the following information report and provide direction as desired. So, um, question for you, would it be possible for us to adopt a, to, to basically enhance what we already have here, but create a, a little bit more clarification and create a more standardized um, process um, without changing the actual structure of, of each policy in the sense of who the appeals need to go to first or second, um, but actually have like a um, include on there that we do have to provide information to the um, to the uh, appellant as far as their right to appeal and the process on how they can appeal. And then also maybe um, adopt a standardized timeline for all the codes, doesn't matter what type of code it is, but give people 10 days and some having 15 days or whatnot, would it be possible for us to do 30 days for all? It gives people enough time to be able to, um, especially if you're lo looking at a small business owner, for them to fully understand the process and get their ducks in a row, 
I would want them to have that, that ability to do that. Um, clarify that it has to be business days and not just leave it for interpretation, um, which we've seen has been a downfall for some of our other stuff that we have going on. And then create a deadline for all codes and make sure that that is specified there, that there is an expiration or there is a deadline. Um, can that be done? Yes, that can all be done. Uh, I have a comment on one of those items that you mentioned, which is extending, standardizing the appeal deadline for everything, just to make it standard for everything. Uh, first of all, there might be some state laws that say the appeal deadline for this has to be 10 days. Okay. And if that were the case, we wouldn't be able to extend it. Okay. Um, other things we can extend, so we can do that. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd say about that is that sometimes the council may not want to extend the deadline because, for instance, uh, like Councilmember Mosby brought up, um, a development project that everybody likes and is really excited about and we want them to break ground as soon as possible uh, gets approved by the Planning Commission. Staff has to wait the entire time of the appeal period that that applicant, that you know, someone in the community has to appeal the council. If it's 10 days, staff has to wait 10 days before we can do anything on that approval, give a building permit or um, give a demo permit or take the next step because we need to wait to see if anybody's going to appeal to the council. So if we extend the deadline for appeals from the Planning Commission to 30 days, then that developer is going to be waiting 30 days to get their building permit or their demo permit or whatever they're applying for instead of 10 days. So there's, a, there's, some, there's pro and con to extending the appeal deadline because staff always has to wait until the appeal deadline expires to see if anybody's going to appeal before we let the developer take the next step in their um, development process. I'm a little confused. Okay. Um, I thought that the appeal was for the actual, you know, business or developer or whatever, if they disagree with a ruling on any one of these codes. Right. So in the planning context, um, the planning commission will decide the, uh, like the, the site plan or the CUP, not the building permit. So the CUP has to be approved, or the site plan, the development permit, uh, has to be approved by the Planning Commission before the developer can then take the next step and get a demo permit or a building permit or whatever the next step after that Planning Commission approval is. Mm -hmm. And staff has to wait the entire appeal period from the Planning Commission approval Roger. before we go to the next step. So if we make it 30 days when it's now 10 days, that's going to be 20 more days the developer has to wait before they can move on mm -hmm. and proceed with their project. So, uh, and that's appeal. That appeal, Jeff, is really from an outside. It's not the developer. It might be an appeal from somebody else. You're talking about. Yeah, it'd be yeah. A, an appeal from a member of the public who doesn't like the development. For instance, the, they have ten days to appeal the planning commission's approval of the development. Okay, and I think. Um, okay, I'll leave it. Councilmember Vega. I think that council should give clear direction on time frames instead of, I think part of uh, what we do here is we're, we look at somebody else and we find something wrong, but sometimes we have to look at ourselves. I think sometimes when we don't give clarity in the direction that we want time frames, such as Councilman Mosby, you brought up some good points. I don't think that we should just say, hey, maybe we should do this and maybe we should do that. I think we should say, hey, what do we want? Councilman um, Starbuck. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just saying because you have, I'm referencing your comments of saying we're going to get a letter and, and city manager has been gracious enough to say, hey, we'll just send a letter out. But you know what happens when we just do things like this and we count on resolutions and we count on someone else to do that. And then sometimes the names change. Uh, and then what happens to that thought process? Again, what we just did, we changed code enforcement to be a written policy so that we could follow and track this with the same token. Every time we ask for a change and we ask for clarity and we ask for notices, uh, for the public, we don't ask for anything in writing or something we can track. So we're going by somebody's memory or somebody's going to go back and look at a council meeting and we're going to go back and see, hey, what did we do here? What did we do there? Uh, so I, I just kind of wanted to reference that, 
If there's any time frames or if you want letters to be written, I think that we should ask to be, it be part of the policy instead of just being counted on it unless it's not that important. Council Member Cordova. Okay, so could we leave the time frames where they're at and just make the um, modification of given providing the information and the appeal procedure as well as clarification for the for the biz for there to say actual business days and um, and create the deadlines for all the codes. Yes, with the exception of um, if the state law says calendar days instead of business days, then we'd have to do calendar days. But for all the other ones, yes, we can do that. Correct, with all that. Okay, I'll turn that into a motion. We'll need to have public comment first. Council Member Vega. Um, Jeff, you mentioned something about developers and the fact that it may extend the time frame for appeals and going to the Planning Commission and this and that. Now, you know, there's time frames from which one Planning Commission meeting goes to the next Planning Commission meeting. So say you get an appeal and you have time frames that, hey, 10 days or 30 days or say maybe it's, it's going to one meeting, but it's gonna, it's gonna coincide exactly with the next Planning Commission meeting. Uh, how does that fall and how is it difficult to agendize something like that so there's no time lost if we extend some of the time frames? Uh, on the appeal process, because you mentioned, hey, somebody from the outside public can come back and appeal, saying, but that's a, that's a different situation, isn't it, from what, what was presented here as far as uh, what we're looking at here? Is that only one, uh, one area? Because I'm thinking that maybe we're making a generic policy for something that really we need to uh, look at the exceptions here, and we may not have enough information to, we, I think we probably need to adopt what we have here with time frames, but then come back so that we can look at the exceptions per your advice and per your direction to see whether it does fall into within state mandates. I don't think we're, we're fully vetting this. I think we're gonna make a decision that we're gonna regret if we don't allow you to do some homework on oh, this. I, I fully agree with you, Council Member Vega. If the council tonight were to make a motion um, to make any changes to these appeal processes, We'd need to bring back that ordinance to do that, and in the staff report for that ordinance, I would advise the council in writing in that staff report, here's why you might not wanna you know, change this one, and here's why you might not wanna change that one, or here what, here's why this one is fine to change. That would all be part of the next staff report that comes back to the I'd council. like to see that, Jeff. I think that's more, uh, that means we're doing our homework and we're doing our part instead of saying yes and no right now. I and I also think that how much time do you need to bring this back, and that way we kind of know, I mean, without putting you to the coals here, uh, are we gonna come back within a couple months, a month, or what are we gonna do here, okay? Or is that putting too much uh, constraint on you? It depends on how high of a priority the council feels this is. Well, I'd like uh, to get so. this out of the way and get this over with while we still remember it instead of it going down the path of council requests that never are to be. So that's why I'm saying. Okay, I can bring it back as soon as possible within the next two months. Anyway, that's just a clarification, uh, Councilman Cordova. I think it's prudent for us to get the information. Again, we brought this up many times that we're making decisions sometimes without fully vetting it, okay? Because there are different situations. Councilmember Mosby. Uh, the removal of abandoned vehicles, I mean, some of these have a level of health and safety component, I think. I mean, that's one that if we did a blanket, I guess that would come back, you'd have a determination on that because you got a, a 10 day, five day component there, and that's probably something that we, we can't go with. Those are the kinds of things that I would put in the staff okay. report, yeah. And like the sterilization of dog, the 10 day component, I'm sure there's a reason why that they had the, uh, the 10 day there. Um, and probably aligning with county code or something like that on that. Um, and again, a little bit, is it overly complicated that if we allow, and can it be allowed as on a zoning, that you allow, if, if it's successful to the applicant, there's 10 days for appeal. If the applicant is denied, you can give them 30 days. Is it okay to have a split like that or does it get kind of discriminatory if you're doing something like that? Um, off the top of my head, I believe that's fine, but it's something that I could also address in the next staff report if you wanted to uh, change it that way. Okay, thank you. 
In this report you provided, I believe I only saw one place where there was a fee recouped. I know that any of these appeals require staff time and a lot of staff time, and I don't see us recouping uh, staff time for appeals. Um, is that something we're allowed to do? Is add fees for appeals? Yes, you can add fees to the city's fee schedule for these appeals uh, as long as the fee that you adopt is not higher than what the staff's cost of bringing the appeal to you is. Okay, and then would this also be the time to consider not just the appeal process or procedures and where they are, but once the appeal comes forward and what parameters um, are set aside for the appeal, such as time frames for the appellant to make their presentation versus no time limit, and then council interaction so that the appeal process becomes more efficient for council meetings. Uh, I would not put those kind of rules in the municipal code, okay. but it can be part of the council's handbook. I think that's where those rules should go. Okay. And if you wanted to uh, bring back an item to amend the handbook in any way needed to have those kinds of rules during appeal hearings, then okay. we can do that. Thank you. Any further questions for Mr. Malave before we open it for public comment? Seeing none, thank you. We will open the floor for public comment. Hello, City Council. My name is Garrett Holsey, Longpool Residence. I'd like to also mention that if we're going to try to establish appeals fee, that um, we should consider that if somebody wins their appeal, then uh, they may not have to pay a fee. Something to consider. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to follow him, the microphone's already up. Um, this was an outstanding job by the city attorney. I never realized how many things we had that we could appeal. And I actually read it cover to cover, it was fascinating. And I learned that there are things that have a five day appeal, but if it happens when there's a three day weekend, it's a two day appeal. And if it happens around Christmas, it's a one day appeal because they have to get at least one day. And if it's a 10 day appeal, it's really probably a five day appeal. And if it's a 14, it's probably nine. And I could go on because I figured them all out. But in one, it said 15 business days. And I think that's the solution. And one of you mentioned, I don't remember which one, that we need to stop, start talk, stop talking about calendar days and change all of this to business days. That's number one. Number two, with the exception of the things that are driven by some other code, I think we could simplify this just as the city attorney did on the code enforcement complaint. And we could divide it into two things. Those which are more urgent, which I would suggest could be 15 or 20 business days, and those which are less urgent, and I would suggest that they could be 30 or 45 business days. And, you know, it's, I can't tell you how many times I've had a phone call from an individual or a business who said, I got this letter from the city and I have no what to do about it. When did you get it? I got it five days ago. It's too late. You can't appeal. You're done. It takes people time to process and it takes them time to speak to someone that they trust about it to understand what they can and can't do. And so a five-day appeal process is absolutely unreasonable. It's not transparent, and it never should have gotten in there. But again, to the city attorney's point, all these were written at different times by different people, and I guarantee you when I was mayor, I never thought about looking at the whole scope of them. So whichever one of you made the motion, good decision. So I would encourage you, A, to make it, the 50, make it business days, uh, B, to select a shorter time period for those things that are health and safety related issues and more urgent, and a longer period for those that are not to allow people to have time. And most certainly, you should change all of the ordinances as the city attorney has offered because otherwise this will get lost in the weeds somewhere in the future. And it should include that any notice 
provide someone with the instructions on the time limit and how to appeal. And I think that'll solve it all. And we will have made a great deal of progress. We will have helped a lot of people who have had difficulty with appeals in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we'll bring it back for discussion. There was a motion put forward. I'm not sure if there was a second, so I will confirm that the motion still stands by Council Member Cordova. Well, I think uh, not because of the fact that, I mean, the city attorney said that he would like to bring back more clarification and information in regards to the, the um, each additional code and what state would require or state law would require or not. Um, so I, I'm, I'm in favor of bringing back an additional report with more clarification, but I still would like to see some of those components that I mentioned maybe thought into some of the possibilities of what we can um, hopefully adopt in this next um, meeting, which would be giving the information um, and the right to appeal as far as the, and, and as well as the procedures, and then maybe seeing if there's a standardized time that we can um, adopt, and then uh, clarification on the business days for each. I have a question about that. Sure. Uh, would the council, we can certainly look into whether a standardized time for all of the different appeals can work, but would the council like to make that standardized time longer than the 10 days that is kind of the average now. Uh, and what would that a ballpark, you know, the longer time be? So Councilmember Cordova, having made the earlier motion, I believe you were re-clarifying your motion and still have the floor to clarify it some more for the city attorney before we take a second and discussion. Well, obviously I had said a 30 day, but if the 30 day doesn't work because of the fact that we have some more pressing items, I would agree with uh, Mr. Lynn's recommendation um, that maybe we kind of um, make, you know, use of some of the ones that are more urgent versus the ones that are not urgent uh, or as urgent, and then also consider the state uh, okay. mandate or law. Okay, I can bring back a report that uh, will cover all of that. Council Member Mosby. I just wonder, I mean, this was my council request. I just wonder if you would uh, afford me the opportunity to maybe provide a, a substitute motion with clarification, which would, would have a little bit more direction for the city attorney, but still have the answers that you're looking for, and we can change things further. But to just move forward with something simple, to say move uh, everything that's, that's appealed to a council, which was my biggest concern on this, was the time frame for the public to get to appeal to council of extending that to 20 business days. But having, as discussed, uh, and the city attorney answered, when it comes to uh, the zoning and planning commission issues, that it, a potential for a split, which is 10 days uh, if the applicant is successful, or 20 days if they're not, um, yeah, if they're not successful, and those being business days. Um, and then he could bring, the, the city attorney could bring back just for clarification if that is something that would work. And that gives us a standardization with a time frame, um, number of days, the 20 day component. I guess it's similar what you're wanting, except it gets a little more refined. So, so for clarity, would you like her to amend her motion to include, or would you like to make it a substitute motion? Because you said substitute at the same time you made an indication that you would like it to be considered, so she could amend her motion. So which would you prefer? What would she be willing to do if she's willing to amend? I'm willing to allow you to do a substitute motion and whatever gets us the information that we need. But I do think that we should also consider that if we are gonna add fees, because I do think that we need to look at if there's a potential for fees, and if we are gonna add fees and, um, and somebody wins their appeal, I agree with the resident that said that they shouldn't be charged that fee then, or we should consider the possibility of, of waiving that fee. Could can I? Well, no, no, I hear you the fee, but can I ask the financial service director, I think he's bringing a fee study back to us, so at that time we could do it at that time? Yeah, yeah well, it's in the budget, but we haven't started that one yet, the user fee study. But that's coming, though. And it's to recoup the costs that staff does. To, so to maybe we could do it at that time. 
on the feed study because we'll be looking at all of them. So we just stay off the feed, keep it, keep it simple enough and just go with my, my simple, my 20 day, for the most part, needs to bring it back. Business days. So we have a motion on the floor that did not receive a second yet. We have a substitute motion on the floor that has also the ability to receive a motion and council member Vega has turned on his light. So would you like to either contribute to one or the other or do you have a separate? Um, I'd like to make sure that they add, or I'd like to bring this up to council member Mosby. Uh, we, we were looking for a 30 day basically, okay, so I get it. I'd like to come in with a compromise as far as business days, we have plus weekends and to exclude holidays as part of it, not just a, a gimme, okay? It's kind of a, it's an automatic here because nobody's open, but if we go to business days, we might as well say excluding holidays if City Hall's closed. And, and I guess 20 business days would pretty much give you the It'd be about days. 28 days, and if there was a holiday, you'd okay. be close. So you'd be real close, like horseshoes, okay? okay? But so I, 20 I wanted to come with a method to our, our madness here, okay? What are we striving for? 30 days, 28 days, 26 days, you know, we just pick something out of the air. But for the benefit of the public, you know, 20 days, if they're business days, plus four weekends and sometimes five weekends, we just about get there. Right. So that would be something I just wanted to clarify and, and add. Yes. I'll give you a second on the substitute motion also if, if uh, Councilwoman Cordova is okay with that substitute motion. Are you going to leave your light on? Because as long as your light's on, you have the floor. Councilmember Cordova. Isn't it already understood that a business day is a business day? Thank you. Yes. Um, so uh, for the city clerk, what clarity would you like regarding the substitute motion that is on the floor and the second that has been given it? That I understand. What I'd like to know is the actual motion that Councilmember Mosby is making. Changing to 20 business days, we're appealed to council. And having the city attorney come back to, to verify that it can be done or can't be done. In the case of uh, zoning and planning, where it's to the, uh, the applicant, if it's in their favor, there's 10 days. If it's against them, it's 20 days. City attorney's not Business days. Business days. That was the substitute motion. I want to point out that that does not include Council Member Cordova's request to um, add provisions to all the appeal sections in the code that say that uh, members of the public need to be notified that there is an appeal provision and what the deadline is. Um, so do you want that to be in your motion as well? Yes. Okay. I'll second that. <laughs> do you have the clarity you need? And you're gonna return this in two months time with the proposed ordinance, is that correct? Thank you, Stacy. yes. Thank you. Okay. As long as we're all on the same page before we Take a vote. Any other questions, concerns? Seeing none, let's vote. Roll Council, call, please. Council Member Mosby? Aye. Council Member Starbuck? Aye. Council Member Cordova? Aye. Council Member Vega? Yes. Mayor Osborne? Yes, and that passes 5 0. Any written communications? Nothing. The floor is open for oral communications for two minutes on any city matter that wasn't addressed via council tonight or uh, could be a future agenda item. John Lynn, very briefly, I want to share with the council that I do not agree with Mr. Wilkie's interpretation of what our NDPES permit requires. Uh, I have reviewed the documents from the environmental and federal environmental agency that he refers to, they do not say that. And I have spent a great deal of time with Tim Smith, our former plant manager, who is 
probably the most knowledgeable person in Lompoc with regard to that. And there is nothing in there that says every restaurant shall have a grease trap. It is based on the amount of material that's coming out of the restaurant. And if any of you would like to come over and read or look at any of those documents, I think it's about a foot deep now, but I have them tabbed up pretty well. So you're welcome to come by and I'll pull them all out and you can look at them. Thank you. Seeing no one else rise, we will close oral communications and bring it back to City Council. Councilmember Vega. Nothing to report. Thank you. Councilmember Cordova. I do not have anything to report. Thank you. Councilmember Starbuck. No reports. Thank you. Councilmember Mosby. It, it just, uh, Kid, I wanted to comment again. I wasn't sure if all the council got what I was getting at um, about the meeting that we had, our special meeting on the 24th, and the fact that there's three to four minutes of that meeting that, that no longer exists, or well, for a while didn't exist on there, and it just happened about the time when I made my motion, and going back to try to review my motion that was on there, it's gone. And that is official record of the city, and we are required to have those documents, that last or a certain amount of time frame that component now two weeks ago i guess it was available and sometimes somehow some way that disappeared and we need to make sure that stuff like this doesn't happen hopefully it can get fixed but it's not right um very concerned uh you know hopefully the city manager can get it figured out and and we don't see any other glitches in other part of the official record. Um, and I'm not sure how we're moving forward. I sat down with Mr. Albro ye yesterday to see if he could review my council request for the upcoming meeting. And you go there and it's not there. So I was not able to spend time and review with him because that at that time frame it, it, it was gone. Well, I understand there's an audio that's being posted back up, but it wouldn't have happened, I guess, if I weren't making the noise that and finding out that it happened. Um, you know, the, another thing that I've asked for was our vacancy reports. Uh, I think we had one last month, but I'd like to see another one. Uh, maybe the city manager can indulge me with, are, are we still fully staffed at fire department? That's a good question. Um, give you one second here. Okay, with, I'll go on, carry on with some others, but I, I was looking, there's definitely a concern with both the staffing at the police and the fire. Maybe those numbers could be available um, as we proceed so, so we can let the public know. Um, as far as the sworn officer component, well, there was a couple of people who said they were only half, half staffed, but we need to make sure that we, we, we get out there and get, get the proper answers to the people. I think it's very important. Right, no, and, and I do agree the, I'm sorry. Um, My last vacancy we, report showed we were down six sworn officers and we were fully staffed in the fire department. Right. So on the vacancy report, there's, there's two pieces to it and we we're going to add a section to the bottom, um, more of an operational. So those that are hired and some were out on, um, one has a broken wrist, another one is getting ready to retire. So they're not physically able to patrol or write a ticket or do anything. So. Um, there's those that are truly vacant and those that are unable light, to Light perform. duty components. Um, some are light duty, some are physically unable to, to do anything at the moment. So we're going to add that at the bottom to show okay. what the total is. So that's a, a more clear picture in the firefighting. Did you, I didn't, there wasn't any on here. Yeah, I don't, it, I don't see any firefighting on here. I think it's moment. very important, especially when the public comes up and, and, and gives a level of fear that we have there, that we have those available so that we can let the right. people know. So I know we're, we're doing the best we can. I know the chiefs are doing the best they can, too. And, and as far as I know, we're still funding everybody as per the budget. Right. No, we're funding everybody. In fact, you know, what we can do is we can, you know, adjust that and have it on a finance website or something if that works for you. Okay. The, the other thing was uh, my public safety commissioner um, had some requests at the last public safety commission meeting 
Um, I'm willing to make a council request to get those on there. Or are you able to get the request? Well, yeah, no, I've, I've talked to the um, police chief. I'm looking over at him. I believe I talked to him about having, if they're a discussion request, to have them placed on there. If it's something that requires um, a level of work that needs to be come before council to request council to approve, um, you know, if it was data retrieval for X amount of years, then that would take a substantial amount of time. Then that's something that needs to come to council first before the staff right. actually works on it. And I think everything we should be able to do, I don't need to make any of those up here that, that you're aware I'm of. I'm trying to remember what they were. I don't, I think they were more of a discussion. Right. I can, I can get with the chief. And, and if there's a value in it, of course it has to come to council. Right. Or expense more than, okay. Um, the, the other component is uh, the capital improvement program book. I know we're a ways from being it approved. I don't know if council member Cordova, did you ever get one of these? Well, my concern is that there's items in here, and we, we never really approved this book, but what I'm finding out is that some of the projects are moving forward in piecemeal. Okay. And specifically, one, one that's in here is uh, redoing the, the front lobby at City Hall. And I think if these projects are in here, I think it's supposed to be a program that's approved by, by council. And what I would like to do is, I, know, I believe we're gonna finally discuss this, I made that request uh, two years ago at the last, uh, at the budget, two years ago, that this book be brought to the council. We've never brought it to us in two years. Um, so I, what I would like to do is, I don't know if I need to make a motion to stop any of these projects or any potential which, other projects. And which project is it in there that you're discussing? This would be page uh, 59 in here. It's uh, the $80,000 redo in the front entrance over here. There's so no, there's a component of this that is anticipated and, and planned. But there's no eighty thousand dollars. It won't that's be eighty. That's correct. But okay. it will be a modification of a level of service. And one of our council priorities in the past was the friendliness of that counter. Correct. And I think if something's going to happen there, I think it should be run by council. So I, I'm asking that 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 stop. And if it has a component of this book, that we bring those by this book, anything by the book, and not piecemeal through the book. But it's not, well, I, I guess my interpretation is it's not a piecemeal. It's just a, an operational change. Moving the cubicles around would be operational changes, so that's not something I usually would bring. Councilmember Mosby, if you want to have a discussion about this, we can bring it back as a future okay. item. Can, can I have things stop prior to this? Or do you, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then can I bring it back this book sometime, or do you have Mr. Albro planned for this to come back to us for discussion? Yeah. And at what time? I mean, I'm over two years, I think I'm right about two years right now and waiting for this to come back to us. Within three months? Uh, honestly, I'd like to take almost another year on that book. Um, we passed everything that were our capital improvements that we're gonna do in the budget book. Um, and the reason why I say that, because I think it needs to have more of you guys venting what you really, really want in that book. Um, that's why it never came back, and we did get overloaded um, with our budget in, in this year, and it was mainly because we were implementing so many software systems, and we got way behind, and it was one of the things that I put on the back shelf, and it was my decision. Um, but I would like to start working on it again, but I would like your input on what kind of projects you want to see, what types of projects you want to see. I'm also trying to, like I said before, separate the development impact fees and those type of developments versus our plan of what we want to do for our city. Um, I, so that is my it. philosophy of what I'd like to see happen. And yeah, I would like to, but I'd like to see a lot of meetings where you guys tell us what kind of stuff you want to see. And we vent those out and we calculate what they're going to, what kind of impact they'll have on the, the physical can, impact. Can we the bring city. back a discussion of this book and so we can analyze how we can do this, please? That's a sure. council yeah, request. It needs to get three votes. Council Member Starbuck? No, absolutely, and I, I'd like to bring up the fact that we're doing a Navy 1600 study, which is based on this book. I'll give you a third. And you have your third. I'd also just like to point out that Council Member Mosby has requested that all of the capital improvement projects stop until that uh, item is brought back. 
The rest of the council may not agree with that, stopping that, but we cannot make that decision tonight. The city manager has agreed at Council Mosby's request to just stop the projects until or, the or item least, comes back. Or at least bring them to us. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not aware of any capital projects. That's the problem. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and the last thing, I just want to thank all the people, uh, including a lot of city staff time that was done at, at the old part of Ryan Park. I guess there's well over 500, 600 gophers that were trapped out there. And those of you who have to drive by and see, um, it, it's not all done, but we're going to stay on it. I know Council Member Starbuck and myself out there with a couple other volunteers this last Friday. We've been there almost every Friday for two, three, four hours. And it is looking more like a park and not like a, a moonscape. And I know city staff put in a heck of a lot of time and I heard, I think they had 38 gophers they got uh, in the football field the other day, trapping them. So just shout out to uh, what a public private partnership can do and um, little by little taking the park back. Thank you. I was invited to Vandenberg Air Force Base in the Hourglass Project Strategy Lab representing the city and participated in that and hopefully the commercial zone that Vandenberg Air Force Base is proposing will move forward. It will be a huge benefit to our community if that does happen. Um, more information will come forward to us as the base um, moves forward on that plan. I attended the CSA, CAC board orientation program as the city representative to that organization the Beautification Commission and the Planning Commission. I hosted a youth leadership workshop here at City Hall last week, and I also had the mayor's bike ride at Healthy Lompoc Old Town Market, and wanna thank all the organizations that supported it and everyone that came out for that ride. It was um, truly a good evening. Wednesday, tomorrow morning, is uh, Congressman Carbajal's vet breakfast at 8.30 at the Vets Hall. So if you are a vet, please be sure and attend. He will be present to hear and discuss issues you're having as well as issue some appreciations and provide breakfast. And again, on Thursday, we have our special city council meeting regarding the sales tax discussion. So we encourage the public to be there for that. The council request that I have is the member of the public who stepped forward regarding the riverbed issue. I know that we invested half a million dollars to clean up the riverbed and gain the ability to protect it through legal pathways. Unfortunately, we didn't fund or designate personnel to maintain that. So I would like for staff to bring back a report in, on the impact of that and what that looks like in the future, what problems are going to come back if the problems are returning and those impacts it's having to those businesses. I'm very concerned that we spent half a million dollars to clean that up and despite whatever we may or may not be able to recruit from other organizations, the fact is it's a hazardous environment for anyone to live in. It's creating a potential water issue if we continue to allow people to return and we're not maintaining our commitment to uh, protecting those that are down on their luck by providing opportunities to keep them from returning. So I'd like a, a report on the condition of the riverbed, what that impact's having, and what we need to do to return that to protection. Council Member Mosby. If you would add on that also getting a bid for a private contractor to do evictions or other components of what we need to do down there to, to solve the problem. Not just look at the problem, but potential solution for the problem. If it would include, yes, it could include several potential solutions, yes. not just private. Okay, so there's a second. Give you I'll give you your third. And we have a third. Thank you for that. And then my second request is part of the homeless issue. Now that we have a community development director again, I would like to see the safe parking program brought back for discussion. We did implement an ordinance, but we are not, haven't implemented a program, and I think it's important. That's on our list. Um, I'm looking to Christy. I know we're working on the staff report right okay. now, so it should be okay. coming shortly. Great, thank you. Um, that is it from me, so we will adjourn this Clark, meeting. Some clarification yes. real quick. Sure. So for Mr. Mo Council Members Mosby's, um, on all CIP, I just had a person whisper in my ear, like electric, Dean had brought up some stuff, stopping N all. Not the items that approved in the budget. 
not not okay. the items that are approved under budget. Okay. Okay. Any other clarification for staff? No. Okay. Thank you. So now we will adjourn this meeting to the next regular meeting at 6:30 p.m. on September 3rd, 2019.